What is there just compensation? And that's a that's a, a, a really an economics problem, figuring out what the fair market value is. And the other question is, is it for a public use? Now that is the language in the US Constitution, public use. Well, there's two cases that uh, will illustrate how this is a controversial issue in the United States, and I suspect it may resonate in terms of the, the issue in this country as well. There was a case decided in 1984 called uh, uh, Hawaii Housing Authority against Midkiff. In the state of Hawaii, the land was largely owned by very few landowners as a consequence of its uh, monarchical uh, history. The lands were owned by the crown of Hawaii. And as a consequence, in the, in the, by the 1960s, 1970s, about 80% of the land in the state of Hawaii was owned by 79 property owners. And the state uh, legislature concluded that this was not good for um, markets, for land markets and they decided to try to do something about it. Now the reality was individuals usually owned their houses, but they leased the property on which their houses sat from these large property owners. So the idea was to try to get ownership of the land connected to ownership of the houses or the homes. And so the way they did it was they passed a law that said uh, if, a, if a certain proportion of people in a predefined area had to be at least five acres in total, if they petitioned the government and they had enough percentage of the population in that area, the government would then use the eminent domain power to acquire the land from the, uh, the underlying land from the landowners, and then they had the option of either selling it to the land, the people who owned the homes, leasing it to the people who owned the homes, or selling it to third parties. Well, the, the 79 landowners, at least some of them, said, now wait a minute, this doesn't sound like a public use to me. This, this sounds like you're taking land from one private party and you're transferring it to another private party even though the, the government is the intermediary. And so they challenged it in the United States Supreme Court or in the lower courts and eventually in the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court said, no, this is okay because it serves a public purpose. Now wait, it, that wasn't the language of the Constitution, right? The language of the Constitution was public use. Well, the court said public purpose, public use, it's all the same. And courts shouldn't get into the middle of this question of determining what's a public purpose. That's a legislative question. So we're going to defer to the legislature as to whether or not this is, is a public purpose. So I was a constitutional law professor at the time. And from thenceforward, I taught all of my students that the public use provision of the Fifth Amendment was meaningless. It, 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 it really placed no limits on the ability of the government to use the eminent domain power, perhaps if they were to take uh, uh, Shruti's property and give it to me and I'm brother of the governor, that might be a little suspect, but otherwise uh, acquisition by government use of eminent domain power for transfer to private parties uh, was found to be okay. Now what was the argument? Well, uh, there, the argument is that, there, that, that this was an important public purpose to try to get the land markets in the state of Hawaii to be more reflective of what free market values might actually be. So that was the law for almost 40 years. And then in 2005, the United States Supreme Court considered another case uh, called Kelo against the city of New London. And the facts in this case were simply, uh, or simplified, were these. Pfizer Inc., which was a large uh, corporation, had decided to locate a facility, a large facility that would employ a lot of people in New London. And New London was a town that was fairly uh, depressed economically. Uh, wasn't, uh, jobs were a problem. But Pfizer said, we'll do this, but only if you, the city, through a sort of quasi-public corporation, development corporation, will acquire the adjacent 90 acres, uh, and then we'll have it developed into a whole lot of stuff. We're going to have movie theaters, hotels, some residences, office buildings, public walkways. Uh, it's going to be great for the people of the town. And most importantly, it's going to generate jobs, and it's going to generate more tax revenue, estimated between about 600,000 and one and a half million per year, annual tax revenue to the city. Well, one of the properties that was taken over the, uh, uh, the exception of the owner was owned by a woman named Suzette Kilo. It was her little cottage, 
in the view of the, of the ocean. And she didn't want to sell. This was kind of her little dream home. I think it was pink, actually. And, uh, uh, and she refused to sell, so it was taken. And she sued on the same theory that those bigger landowners in Hawaii had almost 40 years before. Now, as a constitutional law professor, I said to myself, she's going to lose. I, I know what the precedent is. It's perfectly clear that the Supreme Court says that this provision that says public use doesn't mean public use, it means public purpose, and therefore it's easy to make the public purpose argument because of this increased tax revenue and jobs, right? Well, I was right, she lost. What was interesting about it, though, was the outrage of the public when she lost. There'd been no outrage when the 79 large landowners, some of whom were former royalty, lost. Everybody was okay with that, apparently. But when this uh, case, when Suzette Kilo lost and some other small landowners, there was outrage, not just on the right or the left, but everywhere. The, the far left was outraged, the far right was outraged, everybody in the middle was outraged, and as a consequence, well over half the states enacted some laws restricting the use of the eminent domain power to take land for transfer to pr other private owners. Uh, a good outcome from a property rights uh, perspective. But I think if you, if you put those two cases together and say now, it, it, uh, why the outrage in one and not in the other, well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, people are more sympathetic with people who are like themselves, small landowners, than they are with former royalty. Uh, and in the Suzette Kilo case, there the, the uh, person who was losing out was the small person at the, at the benefit of big business. Whereas in the other case, it was small people who were benefiting at the expense of big business. Now, is that a principled basis on which to say the case should have come out one way in Kilo and the other way? I think absolutely not. Uh, if we start deciding cases based on the wealth of the plaintiffs or the defendants, I think we've corrupted our system significantly. So those were the cases uh, that illustrate how the issue has existed in the United States, and I think that the, uh, uh, there's a lot of issues there relating to equal treatment, due process, fair, uh, treatment amongst people. But let me address now th the other side of this, which is sort of the economics. What, what are the implications of allowing property rights to be subject to this sort of discretion on the part of the state? Because that's really what we have here. We have a huge amount of discretion on the part of the state or any government, community, county, city, whatever, to, to conclude what is a public purpose. And if it is a public purpose, then they can acquire the land. They do have to pay just compensation, but they can acquire the land, notwithstanding uh, the language of the, uh, of the U.S. Constitution. Well, I think it's all we have to understand, and it's simple and it's obvious to all of us, I assume, that property rights are, are critical to the functioning of, of, of the economy. Uh, uh, Shruti mentioned this morning, or maybe yesterday, the, the importance of scarcity. Well, I would argue you know, you can say you live in a socialist country or a socialist system or you live in a system where everybody owns, owns all the natural resources or the state owns the natural resources or particular communities own the natural resources. But the reality at the end of the day is we have property rights. The chair you're sitting in, I assume, belongs to Jindal, but you're, it, it's your property in a sense right now. You're occupying it. We all have an understanding that if you're sitting in it, I can't come and throw you out. And we probably understand if you leave your stuff there when you go out to have tea, you come back, it's still your chair. So in that sense, you have, you have something that's like a property right. And I would say that's true with virtually everything except non-scarce resources. Somebody ultimately gets to use it. And if you're in a socialist state, it usually turns out to be the people who happen to be in power who end up having the equivalent of, of the property rights. And that is not a system that's conducive to uh, economic uh, productivity wise use of resources, efficient use of resources. Uh, and, and so I would argue that the, at least as important as the questions of fairness and due process and compliance with the Constitution is the importance of having secure and enforceable property rights to having an economic system that can generate the wealth that a society needs to become more prosperous. Now often I find with my students that w one of the objections uh, to, to making these arguments is, well, what about the fact that some people have a lot more than others? They get concerned about wealth distribution. Well, I care about wealth distribution, and I think we need to find ways to redistribute wealth to create more fairness in society, but I also know that if we're going to redistribute wealth, we have to generate wealth. 
And we're not going to generate wealth effectively unless we have a secure and enforceable property rights. And I would say, of all the subject matters in the, in the, in the courses that our students study in the United States that are most critical to the prosperity of the community and the welfare of the community and of the individuals in the community, it's property and contract. Those are the two things that allow a market system to run and I'm a firm believer that market systems are the most efficient way to generate wealth and to use resources uh, wisely. As I think about that, the, what we have when we have rules like this that say the government can take property if they see it as a public purpose, is we make rights contingent. We make them contingent on the decisions, the unpredictable decisions, of government officials. Now, if we happen to be politically influential, we can get those contingencies to work in our benefit but if we're not, we have no idea, and are we going to invest in, in the development of a piece of property, or the management of resources, uh, if we have no idea whether we'll get to harvest the corn or the crop or retain the building uh, the, next, the next day, the next year? No, I think our incentives are deeply diminished as a, as a consequence. One other example that I think of because I've, I've heard reference to the concept of public trust a couple of times during the course of this conference. And uh, it's a subject on which I've done a lot of work and I, and in, in the United States and in, and in many places around the world. The, the public trust doctrine, as it's called, has been used by uh, and argued by a lot of environmental interests to try to do everything from protecting uh, uh, wildlife habitat to dealing with climate change. And in fact, there's a, a recent uh, decision of the of a court in the Netherlands holding that the public trust doctrine basically recognizes a right in individuals to require the government of the Netherlands to t take measures that they have previously decided they don't want to take in terms of, cli uh, of climate uh, uh, protection. Uh, and I would say that the public trust doctrine, it properly understood in the common law world, is a very narrow doctrine that applied to navigation and fishing on navigable waters, it developed in English law, I don't know if it applies in Indian law it certainly applies in American law, adapted a little bit to the different geography of North America. But it's a very narrow doctrine which advocates for uh, greater government intervention in the marketplace are using for all manner of purposes that do the same thing as this public purpose interpretation. They make rights contingent. They make rights uncertain. They make rights unenforceable in a way that allows people to uh, use their uh, property wisely. So let me conclude with uh, uh, a quotation from, one of my favorite quotations from a United States Supreme Court justice, which goes to a point that was discussed earlier in the context of the separation of powers debate or discussion. One of the questions that was posed, uh, and, I, and it's often posed, is well, if parliament or the legislature isn't gonna solve the problem, somebody's gotta do it, and we'll have the courts do it. Well. To that, I would say that's, that's a, a risky proposition. And the case that, from which this quotation comes was a case very much like that. It was during the Korean War. The United States, as you know, was engaged in Korea in what may have been an ill-advised war, but there we were. And President Harry Truman decided that in order to support the war effort, he needed to seize, to take control of, really to violate the takings clause, that we've just been talking about, uh, the steel mills, uh, all the steel mills in the United States and have the U.S. Army run them. And he did it. He did it not with any authority from Congress. Uh, he just did it. He was challenged in court. The Supreme Court said, Harry Truman, you can't do that. That's a violation in excess of your executive powers. Uh, and, and uh, of course, the order was really not affecting what had happened because it had already happened, the war was over by the time the Supreme Court said it. But they made the point uh, in, in these words by Justice Felix Frankfurter, and I think they speak to whether we're talking about executive power, we're talking about the protection of property rights, we're talking about the protection of any liberties of individuals. I think this speaks to why it's not a good idea to say, well, somebody's got to do it. And this is what Felix Frankfurter wrote in uh, a case which we refer to as uh, the steel seizure case. Quote, the accretion of dangerous power does not come in a day. It does come, however, slowly from the generative force of unchecked disregard of the restrictions 
that fence in even the most disinterested assertions of authority. So if the government states the very best of reasons today to do something, that creates precedent for something else tomorrow and something else the next day. And at the end of the day, I think liberty is lost. And that's neither in the interest of individuals nor of the community. Thank you.